Those of you who were at the review session last night, good, better, worse, same than the first one? Better? Because we didn't have to go through all that introduction stuff. I think that is part of the key. Um, so we were able to actually just get into the content. I'm glad to hear you say it felt less rushed because there was times where I was like, all right, we're just doing this content real fast because I can't reteach you all the content. Here's what you kind of need to know. Uh, yeah. Well, I like the fact that you brought some top ten back and it felt like there was more of them. There were. I did. I put more in than I originally planned because that was overwhelmingly what every one of my classes said, like, yes. So, like, I included one basically for every single. So for hopefully, because that's kind of like what you can memory about everything you hear you and you can actually talk about it. Yeah. Good, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that that, that, that was, uh, that that met with your approval. How about the vision quest? Was that okay? Was that good? Was that worth the five minutes or ditch it? Keep it? Okay. Was that? Yeah, I was trying to get it all into one slide. I know you can't see it on your handout at all. I was hoping on the screen. It's never as big on the screen as I think it should be. Well, it's just because of how small like, the actual picture is yeah. on the screen. I don't know how to make that bigger. Yeah. I'll see if I can find out. I'll talk to I'll talk to audio visual. Uh, so next week the review is Thursday, um, and then again, just reminder, next week, Wednesday, you do not have a late start, okay? Next week, Wednesday is the AT free administration. You'll be here, you'll go to the main gym, every single person in the school who is doing an AP test will be in there. And don't think of it as a tedious, awful thing that you have to do. Think of it as arts and crafts time, because you're going to fill in a bunch of bubbles and you're going to play with stickers. So it's arts and crafts time in the main gym with all of the smartest people in the school. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that a fun way to think about it? Yeah. Is this a question about arts and crafts time? Yeah. All right. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure you're excused from it. <laughs> Careful. Don't stab the can or try to get the can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe so. I would double check though, and I would also uh, make sure to let your teacher know. Uh, so that's next Wednesday, and then Thursday night is our review session, and then Tuesday, when everybody doesn't have school except the people testing, you are also taking a test, um, and that will be the day of our practice test. I'll actually I'll ask you next week how many people think they're going to make it. I do really want to strongly encourage you to make it, and here's why. As I've said before, I think it is the best single thing we do to prepare for the exam. It's a chance to go through the entire exam, um, to see what it's like, to sit through it, to do it, to see how it feels. Um, I will give you, um, I just put together, like I said the other day, I put together a huge grading sheet with it. So you will get the answers to the multiple choice. I'll grade the multiple choice. You'll get the answers with feedback for each one. Here's why it is A and why it's not B, C, or D. So you get that for all the multiple choice questions. And then there's answer keys for the essay questions. I'm not grading the essay questions, but there's answer keys for them. And we'll actually have a breakfast club to go over the essays, anybody who wants to come in and do that. Uh, we don't have time in class to do it. Um, but... Uh, it's really, really valuable, and I know it's it's tough to convince yourself to get up at 8 o'clock, to be here at 8 o'clock, rather, on a day that you don't have school, um, but I really think you will find it worthwhile to do that. It's worth the three and a half hours that it's going to take out of your day, and then the rest of the day is yours. Um, so it, it's really worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean... Yeah, uh, so buses are running that morning. Um, if you want to take the bus there, the only problem is they're not going to be running home until like 2 o'clock and will be done by about 12.30. It starts at 8. Uh, that's when Mrs. Koo says she wants to start it, so it'll start at 8. And we'll talk more about how to actually take the exam also because I have an exact plan for you of what you need to do and the timing and everything, and it's not exactly the way the college board says to do it. Um, but I think it's better. Um, so, is there more details that you need than that? Jack, did you have a question about it? I was just 
Yeah. Oh, it's in 157, like the room right next to the cafeteria, like the study hall, oh, right next to the cafeteria. That's where that's where we got. And like I said, I even reserved the same person who's going to be proctoring your exam on the day, on May 6. I talk about replicating test day situations. Yeah. Pretty proud of that. Um, all right. If you would be so kind as to take out your notes that you took from the textbook and the readings you did last night. Okay, so the first part we were going to talk about is from your textbook notes. And the question I want you to focus on is, what is the legacy of World War II? The war is over now. What is the legacy of World War II? And that was the first part of the textbook reading. So with your partner, take about one minute to have that conversation. What is the legacy of World War II? Go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe more than anything else, one of the things I would like to focus on um, is just the levis the levisy. The legacy of death and destruction that World War II left. This was a total war on an unprecedented scale. Civilians were majority of the casualties. If you look at this, the middle column there, the first column of numbers, those are military deaths. But then you look at total deaths. You know, the Soviet Union has over twice as many civilian deaths as they do, as they do military deaths. Poland, only 240,000 military deaths, 5 million total deaths. Look at some of these numbers. Look at how many people died in China. 20, 20 million. Look at how many died in Russia. 24, 24 million people. If you look at a list of battle casualties, Russia had five battles in which they lost more people than America lost in the entire war. You have to go down to number six in the top casualty losses. Russia had three battles where they lost more than a million people. Just battles, not the war, battles. They had three individual battles where they lost more than France, United Kingdom, and almost the United States combined. So I think one of the big legacies that we need to remember is just the incredible number of casualties, the incredible number of dead, and how many of them were civilians. Um, the only thing I'd like to add to that is make sure you have the idea of the displaced persons that was in that reading. How many people are homeless right now after the war? How many people are away from their home? Their homes have been destroyed. They're forced to flee their country, refugees, whatever you want to call them. For after World War II, we generally call them displaced persons. Um, so now I want to go to the first of your two readings, the, the handout that I gave you, the three trends. Uh, what I want you to do with your partner is talk about those three trends 
you, you're asked to do a sentence summary. I'll come around and check that in. You're asked to identify the three trends. And then what I want you to do is talk about which one you think is most significant. So talk about the three trends. And then which one of those three do you think is most significant? Uh, as I come around, show me both of your sentence summaries, OK? All right, go ahead. of the Cold War, the question I want you to talk about with your partner is one that may be familiar by now. We've talked about it for the last two hot wars we've had. Was the Cold War inevitable? Based on just that brief little excerpt that you got yesterday, that you got last night, was the Cold War inevitable? We're going to come back to this question a few times starting next week. So right now, based on just the what page and a half reading you had on it, was the Cold War inevitable? Go ahead. One last question before we get into the new material for today. I put that brief little blurb about the peace treaties that ended World War II in there. Turn to that little part at the end of the reading. I want you to think about the way World War I ended. Think about the conversation we had about World War I ending. About the ambiguity and how that set up for problems later. Now, take a second and talk about how the end of World War II was different. How the treaties that ended World War II were different than the way World War I ended. Go ahead. <laughs>
let's chat about the post-war. Now, I put a question on there that seems melodramatic. The war was won. Who would win the peace? But I think it's a really important question. Because think about what happened to Germany at the end of World War I. They didn't necessarily lose the war, but they sure lost the peace. And so this is an important question, how this is going to turn out. One of the other things I want you to think about as we're going through this lecture is the failures of the peace of World War I. How did that peace fail? Before we get into what we're going to do right now, we're going to have that conversation. How did the peace of World War I fail? Because I want that in the back of your head as we're going through World War II. We'll see how well they learned some lessons. Go ahead. How did the peace of World War One fail? Go ahead. Things may have been better had they followed what plan after World War One? Jack, say it again. Wilson's 14 points. Did they follow Wilson's 14 points? No. But a lot of those things, had they been followed, probably would have been better. But they weren't. So the planning for the post-war actually starts during the war. So we're going to talk about some meetings that happen during the war that are relevant to the post-war. All right, so we're going all the way back to um, August 1941. Churchill and FDR meet. Okay, it's called the uh, Atlantic Charter. They meet on a boat off the coast of Canada. Now, hold on a second. This should be thrown up all kinds of sideways and doubts. When are they meeting? Before what? Well, it's well before the war's ended. The war's just started. Before the U.S. is in the war. This is months before Pearl Harbor. The United States is not in the war. They are neutral. They are not supposed to be meeting with anybody. Which is why they are meeting on a boat in the middle of the, off the coast of the Atlantic. They're meeting in international waters because this is illegal. But now I want you to think for a second. Can you imagine what would happen if a German U boat sunk this boat? People in New York could see, you could be in the Empire State Building and you could see U boats off the coast of the United States. They were in international waters and you could see them. Imagine if a U boat stumbled across this week. How that changes the course of world history. So now, these two men, Churchill and FDR, at this meeting, they agree. That once the U.S. gets in the war, and you know, we can legally talk about these things, that after the war, they're already planning for after the war, that they are going to uphold Wilson's 14 points. Essentially, at this meeting, they admit the post-war failures, the post-World War I failures. And they say, we're going to try to fix those problems. I'd say there's two parts to answer that question. One, they wanted pictures of them. And two, there was reporters at this meeting. Pictures taken by reporters. But reporters back then did things a little differently. For example, do you guys know that FDR had polio? Almost nobody in the United States at the time did. Because the reporters helped him cover it up. In fact, almost every picture you see of FDR standing, one of two things is true. He either has a vice grip on the podium he's standing at, or look at the picture on the left right there. He's being held up by an officer. 
And it looks real casual, right? Like he's just kind of hanging out there. But he's like leaning on him. And the press just kind of, it's fine. Nobody talked about it. Can't have a president with a disability. Right? But not during wartime. He needs to be tough. He needs to be strong. Almost, he was almost never photographed in a wheelchair. He refused to allow people to photograph him in a wheelchair. Um, and so this was just, things were a little different back then. I guess that's the best way to answer that question. Not necessarily better, just different. Um, so that's the first meeting. The next meeting is in Morocco, is in North Africa, at Casablanca. Ironically, it's at the White House. Because that's what Casablanca means. Try to keep up, kids. Uh, this is also Churchill and FDR. Now, the United States is in the war at this point, so it's not an illegal meeting. It is at this meeting that they agree that they are going to fight until unconditional surrender. What does that mean? Let's see a hand on this one. What does unconditional surrender mean? Um, unconditional surrender is when like, the opposing side surrenders without any like stipulation. Exactly. Not like, hey, we want this. No, the fine, then we're going to keep whooping you until you just say we give up. How is that different from World War I? Did Germany unconditionally surrender after World War I? No. And then you're like, really? Surrender? They asked for an armistice. And so this is one of those key moments where they're trying to undo the ambiguity from World War I. They want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Here is a political cartoon. Um, that's FDR. There's Churchill. Uh, I want you to talk about your. So, what is, where is this right here? Well, how do you know it's Italy? Hey? Looks like the heel of the boot, right? So, if this is Italy, what does this make this? North Africa, which is where they met, right? And who controls North Africa? England, U.S., France, right? So talk with your partner about what this cartoon, Flying Statesman, 43 Spirit, Global Plans, and who these guys maybe are. What is going on in this cartoon? What is the artist getting at? Go ahead. Now, the next meeting we need to talk about was one that was in your reading. And this is, this is one of the two biggest meetings because the big three are here. Okay, and this one is in Tehran, which is in Iran. And this is the first one the big three are all at. Big three of FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. Now, I tend to think about Tehran kind of like a first date because they all were getting together. They all knew they had like different things going on, and they basically wanted to avoid controversy as much as possible. They're trying to make sure this alliance can work. They're trying to make sure they can get together with this. So as much as possible, they're trying to avoid controversy. Now, there is a very big issue that comes up, and I alluded to it yesterday, and it was mentioned in your reading, too, and I want to make sure you understand it. You don't need to throw your stuff, Stacey. It's okay. Like, we're going to be, we're going to get through this. Uh, so Stalin is pushing from the east, and he's essentially, essentially bearing the brunt of the entire Axis forces. 
And he's saying you need to open another front. Open up another front. Stalin's saying open up another front in France so we can have a vice grip. Germany fights a two-front war. We know that doesn't work out well for them. But Churchill is saying, nope, we should come up through the Balkans. And the reason Churchill is saying that is, again, he is already planning for the post-war. Because he knows that if Stalin pushes all the way through to Berlin, he is going to have boots on the ground in this entire Eastern European area. That he is going to be occupying that entire area. And once he's there, it's going to be really hard to get him out. And so Churchill's saying, come on up through the Balkans. We'll launch a second offensive right through here. It'll be great. Because he knows then the British and American come up through here. They cut off Stalin. That's his plan. But as I said yesterday, Stalin says, hey, if you do that, I'm just going to get out of the war. I'm going to make peace with Hitler. <laughs> Churchill says, you're bluffing. You'll never do that. Stalin says, I did it before. Why wouldn't I sign another treaty with him? I've already got all the territory I lost to him, plus some. I'll get out of this war. I don't need to stay in this war. Plus, tactically, this was a better plan. And FDR recognized it, basically forced Churchill into it. I want you to get a good look at FDR in this picture. Still looks all right, doesn't he? Now look at him less than two years later. At the last of the big conferences we'll talk about, or the last of the big three. Dear God, he looks like death warmed over. It's like Weekend at Bernie's. Do you guys even know that reference? Does that make any sense to you? Okay, a couple of you. Um, it's like, oh, he's not that bad. Like, ah! um, it's like this zombie that ate FDR. Um, Churchill still looks good because he's pickled. Um, like when you drink as much alcohol as Churchill did, like it preserves you. It's like embalming fluid for him. That's not an endorsement of it, by the way. That's not a suggestion. Um, when we turn off the recording, I'll tell you some good Churchill stories if we have time. Um, so the next meeting is at Yalta. Um, and this uh, this one was also in your reading. This one, Yalta is in the Crimea, by the way, if you're wondering where it is. Um, and your reading talked about a few things. I just want to highlight a couple here. Um, essentially, at Yalta, Stalin promises free and open elections in Eastern Europe. And honestly, if you can't take the word of such a trustworthy, upstanding guy like Stalin, like, who can you trust? Because he promised. Like, ser like, seriously, like, he promised. Like, they did that. No, they didn't. But, like, he promised. Uh, they also agreed on the idea of a United Nations. They agreed they're going to divide Germany into four occupation zones. They agreed, write this down and then I'll explain. They agreed they would move Poland west. What I mean by that is they agreed after the war that they're going to take some land from Germany, give it to Poland, because they're going to take some land from Poland and give it to Russia. So that's how it moves west. Does that make sense? They're like lopping off part in the east, giving that to Russia, and lopping off part of Germany and giving that to Poland. And then one of these seemingly useless bits of information that actually really comes into play Russia agreed to help the U.S. in the Pacific once the war in Europe was over. Russia agreed to help the U.S. in the Pacific once the war in Europe was over. What did I say? Yes, thank you. The USSR, thank you. Yeah? Um, were there already sort of icy relations between the U.S. Absolutely. and Absolutely. Then why didn't he ask Churchill? 
Why didn't who ask Chair Chair for what? For what? Well, I'd say there's two parts to it. One, England has like eight able-bodied men left at this point, maybe nine. Um, there was that one guy, he was kind of limpy, but he was okay. Um, but the other part is Russia has interest in the Pacific, right? Um, so, I, like, this was an offer that, <laughs> to, to use a little godfather parlance, this was an offer that FDR couldn't refuse. Sounds like, once the war in, the, in Europe's over, I'll help you in the Pacific. And FDR's like, oh... Awesome. Now, and I think this will further answer your question, Colin, too. The U.S. didn't want Russia's help because they already knew they were going to have to Soviet Union's help. The U.S., the West already knew they were going to have to divide up Europe and divide up Germany and share with Russia, share with the Soviet Union. They didn't want to do that in Japan. So it behooved them to have a quicker end to the war in Japan before Russia could get involved. Which encouraged the use of what? The atomic bomb. Because that brought about a quicker end to the war. Before the Soviet Union could get involved. So those are all the meetings that are going on during the war. And then we have the first meeting after the war of the Big Three. Here's the Big Three. It's Stalin, Truman, and Clement Attlee. What the hell happened? This isn't quite as impressive as a Big Three as Stalin, FDR, and Churchill, right? What happened to FDR? He died. He died. He stroked out. What happened to Churchill? He lost the election. The man who saw England through the blitzkrieg, who led them through all of these horrible years, who was the inspiration, he loses the first post-war election. Now, there's a couple logical reasons for this, and you don't need to write this down, but I'll explain because some of you are like, how should that happen? One, essentially during the war, any issues that came up that weren't directly late related to the war, Churchill was like, not important. People are like, what about wages? Not important. What about like housing? Not important. Is it going to help us beat Hitler? No, not important. Which is fair enough, right? He was focused on one task. But the people were kind of tired of that by the time they get to the end of the war. The other reason I'll say is that Churchill was seen as a wartime leader. And the people of England were anxious to get past the war. And they wanted somebody who wasn't quite as aggressive and belligerent as Churchill. And Clement Attlee is going to bring in a whole new approach, and we'll get to this when we get to the Cold War, about the relationship between government and people. And so the conservatives, which Churchill was the leader of, the conservatives are out has much more to do with domestic politics than it does with international politics. Um, at this meeting, basically the discord is incredibly deep. Well, oh, excuse me, I should have met, at Yalta, your reading talked about this. Basically, pretty much the meeting broke down almost immediately. Like they're trying to agree on these things, they're trying to make these things happen, and the agreements are just breaking down almost before they can even get on paper. And now we get to Potsdam, that's this conference. Potsdam is in Germany, by the way. Um, and really the only thing they agree on at Potsdam, and you guys are going to think I'm making this word up, but I swear to you I'm not. They agree on a policy of denazification. Let's see a hand on that. What do you suppose that one means? What do you mean? Bigger than that. That's an example. That's actually going to be the next thing they agree on here. What do you suppose it means? Denazification. It's like kind of destroying uh, Nazi ideology and like basically like erasing. 
They want to do that, but that's not what denazification is. They do want to do that, though. From what? This one's focused on Germany. Remove the Nazis from what? Government positions. Get them out. Because if you wanted to be a government worker in the decade before World War II, what did you have to belong to? Nazi Party, right? You had to. There was no way you couldn't. If you wanted to have any government position, if you wanted to be a mailman, if you wanted to be a fireman, if you wanted to be a teacher, you had to be a member of the Nazi party. Had to be, or you couldn't work for the government. So what are you going to do? Fire every single teacher? I've always said before, and maybe I shouldn't say this since I'm recording and putting it on the web, if I was around in Germany in the 1930s, I would have been a member of the Nazi party. Because I have no other marketable skills besides this. Like they would have been like, do you want to be a teacher? Uh-huh. Then you have to sign this card and be a member of the party. Okay. I have to feed my family. Right? I don't have to agree with their politics. If somebody came and told me the only way you could remain a teacher is you have to join, you know, the bull moose party, I'd be like, okay. I always liked bull mooses. Bull mooses. Yeah. What? The only way you can teach there. Thank you. That's fantastic. See, it's not just me. You guys aren't just looking at me like Nazis. You're like Alice's family, also Nazi. Wait, no, it's not <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's the first. That's the first time I've gotten like a first-hand example of that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Huh. And like I piss and moan when my Wi-Fi is not working well. You know, I'm like, why can't I get a signal here? What the hell? This is a different world, isn't it? All right, we need to keep moving. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. Uh, so I just like this political cartoon of the big three, three tough ones. You've got the British lion, the Russian bear, and then Truman came in. I'm a Missouri mule. He was from Missouri. Um, I just think that's kind of an amusing thing. By the way, who made the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan? Truman did. He was FDR's vice president for about three months. FDR died. The Joint Chiefs called Truman into a meeting and were like, by the way, um, we know you don't know anything about this, but we've been developing a top secret weapon that can wipe out an entire city with one bomb. Um, and we're finished with it. And we need to know if you think we should use it. I'll wait for your answer. Like that's basically how it was dropped on Truman's death. Um, Truman, for his part, to, to the day he died, every book he ever wrote, every speech he ever gave, he said it was simple math. He looked at the numbers that the generals gave him for how many casualties there would be American and Japanese if there was an invasion of Japan. And he compared that with the numbers that would be lost if we used a nuclear bomb. The nuclear bomb was always lower on both sides, for the Japanese as well, obviously, for America. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting about these meetings, you can tell how well the war is going for the Allies by where the meetings are. The first meeting takes place on a boat in the other hemisphere. They're not even close to the continent. Then we're at least in the hemisphere, but we're in Africa. The Allies have picked up ground in Africa. Then we're still kind of on the continent, but we're dancing around it. We're over here in the Middle East. Now we're getting closer. We're at least in Europe. And then the last meeting, we're in the belly of the beast after we defeat them. Meetings in Germany. You can tell how the war is going by where the meeting is. We're doing pretty good on time here. We're doing all right. Um, I want you to talk with your partner about this cartoon. 
Um, what is the um, artist getting at? What is he trying to say? What points, especially from that textbook reading, um, are they bringing up here? Go ahead. Okay, this one I think is a really powerful cartoon. This is saying in 1944, what did Europe want to be delivered from? Nazi dictatorship, help us. But by 1946, it's famine, starvation. Germany especially was completely devastated. More so than any other country. And that's going to play a big role in our Cold War moving forward. I mean, what was the number? I, I want to say it was, I have it written down somewhere here. 20 million homeless people in Germany. 20 million. And so that's going to play a big role because this is a humanitarian crisis. Remember the Bolshevik cartoon that we looked, the cartoon after World War One, where the guy said, like, you don't, you want to forget the peace terms? Like, here's an alternative. What was the alternative that he offered him? Bolshevism, right? Liquor, yeah. Did somebody say beer? Is that what I heard? Um, offered Bolshevism. That's going to be the fear if this keeps up. Um, so this is, uh, this next slide is setting up a big part of the Cold War. This is part of our reading for it. When it talks about Germany being divided into four occupation zones, bless you, this is what they mean. Each of the allies are going to get their own zone that they are in charge of, that they control. They are like the police for it. They're the courts for it. They're in charge of humanitarian relief. So England gets their zone, America gets their zone. They feel like they have to give France a zone. And then the Soviets get a zone. It's a great question. Uh, basically, I was hoping somebody would ask it. Basically, they realized to make post-war Europe operate, France had to be part of the game. And even though they were useless in World War II, they were like, we're going to need them moving forward. So we're going to let them feel important and give them a little zone over here. It's to give France legitimacy moving forward. Because all of Europe's like, they didn't do anything in World War II. But now they're kind of playing a role in the peace, and it's to solidify their importance, maybe. So I'm reading the map correctly, then why is there this one part in the eastern part of Germany that completely took that out? You didn't let me finish. Because all four of these places are different zones of occupation. Does anybody know what that is? It's Berlin. Berlin is also divided into four. But Berlin is entirely within what? The Soviet sphere. The Soviet zone. But this is like right here. Look at that. That's like a little piece of America right there. That's like a little piece of England. That's like a little piece of France. Surrounded by Soviet. This is setting up the Cold War right here. This is going to be one of the biggest chapters of the Cold War. They had the they had the largest piece of Berlin. They had about I want to say it was like forty five percent of the city or something like that. So they couldn't let them have more than half. It was like close. Uh, and so we're going to see this and all of this is going to be a very big factor moving forward when we get. Now somehow I got lost. Um, so these are a couple cartoons. Yeah, check. What was the little thing in the Isn't that Luxembourg or something stupid like that? Um, probably. Right? I don't even know. I didn't make the map. I think it's something like dumb like that. Luxembourg. 
shopping. Uh, so I want you to take a look at these cartoons. Talk about what you think is going on in them. Talk about what the artist is getting at. What's his message and what's his point of view? Go ahead with your partner. Have at it. Now, the next one, this is one of the most famous ones. This shows Stalin, and it shows so Soviet Russia in Soviet strategic bloc, communist or influenced by communism, under strong political pressure, not yet decided. And so what is this essentially saying? All of Europe is at least under his threat, right, in his reach. I think one of the big points about this to remember is that the Soviets had boots on the ground. They had soldiers all the way into Germany. They had far more soldiers in Europe than the than the rest of the Allies did combined. And that plays a very big role. Because the U.S. can say, you can't do that all they want, but the Soviets have troops. Soviets have boots on the ground. I've got like two minutes to go through the last four big points. Sorry, I kind of lost track there a little bit. Um, we have the Nuremberg Trials. These are the war trials. These are the trials for war crimes. These are crimes against humanity. This is the idea that some of the things were so heinous, were so awful, they cannot just be categorized as part of war. Um, this was for the people who perpetrated the Holocaust. Actually, tomorrow, remind me, I want to start with this. We'll do this before we even do the LAQ tomorrow, because I don't want to shortchange this part. Another very important part about post-war is the United Nations. What is this an example of? Yeah. But we had one. We had a League of Nations, right? What did I say the League of Nations was? It's a permanent meeting. This is a better permanent meeting. Or at least that's the plan. Uh, this just shows you who was in it originally. And who the uh, permanent seat on the Security Councils are US, France, Great Britain, USSR, and China. And then we'll just write these two things down real fast. The uh, big issues with the bomb right now, early on, are that we have it and nobody else does. Question is who should have the right to use it? Who should have the right to have that much destructive power? And then the United Nations creates the State of Israel. And that is obviously going to cause uh, a lot of long-term tensions in the Middle East. They basically carve up the Palestinian state and create Israel. Here's your take-home test. It's an LEQ quiz. Bring this with you tomorrow. Nice job today, folks. Thanks for the work. We'll see you tomorrow.